thank you. I want to first welcome everybody that's here in South Florida that's at this program today. What do we hear from you all? Good morning. Our sponsor, our gold sponsors were EMD, Serono, and Sandoz. Our silver sponsor was Bristol Myers Squibb. Our bronze supporters, Memorial Healthcare System, Santa Fe, and Beatrice. Our community sponsors, Mallinckrodt, Alexion Pharmaceuticals, and TG Therapeutics. And our exhibit sponsors, FlowMed Infusions, Genentech, First Choice Neurology, and Novartis. And let's give them a round of applause for being here to do this program today. Thank you. This is Dr. Harvey Samowitz. Dr. Samowitz believes that a strong doctor patient relationship is critical for successful outcomes and management of the total patient. In some cases, this may require high tech or aggressive therapy. While in many situations, it is because it is it may result in nutritional supplements, minimally evasive therapy or simply reassurance. Every patient is unique and Dr. Samowitz is able and willing to do whatever is necessary and in the best interests of that individual, combining compassionate care with state of the art medicine. Dr. Samowitz is by trade a urologist. He's gonna be keeping the program very, very um, safe for you all to eat while he's presenting, okay? <laughs> and let's welcome Dr. Samowitz. Thank you very much, Stu. So first, I want to thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. And I think what you're doing is fantastic. And I want to thank you for putting together these, uh, these events because uh, there's a lot of other diseases out there that don't have uh, the, the same thing. So we appreciate it very much. Uh, I want to mention that I'm board certified in both general urology and female pelvic medicine reconstructive surgery. And there is no specialty of neurourology. Uh, and the, the Board of Female Pelvic Medicine Reconstructive Surgery is about as close as we have to neurourology. So those of us that are separately boarded in that field, that subspecialty, do have to deal a lot with the, the patients that have the urological, neurological diseases associated with uh, uh, their voiding function and dysfunction. So voiding dysfunction is sort of a broad uh, term that we use. Uh, it can mean anything from urinating too frequently or too much to not urinating at all or to having incontinence. These are the major issues. I'm going to run through these slides rather quickly. I have about 30 slides. I have 30 minutes, so I'm going to try to keep it to one minute per slide. Uh, so overactive bladder is a huge problem. 48 million Americans have overactive bladder. And what that is, is we're a bladder that wants to contract without the owner's intention. Uh, usually it means that the bladder is not quite full, but the patient has that urge to void. Urinary retention obviously means that the patient is unable to void or they are not voiding to completion. They're leaving a lot of urine behind perhaps, even if when they do have overflow. And in those patients, it's uh, a more complicated situation because uh, we have to try to get them to empty completely. The bladder basically has two functions, store urine and empty urine. And I'll get into that a little bit more, uh, how that is the way we translate things. Urge incontinence is where the patient has incontinence uh, because the bladder has contracted without their permission and they're on their way to the bathroom perhaps, but they can't get there fast enough. Stress incontinence is usually mostly just females where the urethra, the sphincter valve that's supposed to keep them dry is not functioning properly. And therefore that valve is loose or it opens up too easily and the urine comes out with coughing, sneezing, laughing, lifting, straining, bearing down, jumping or running or any kind of movement that creates abdominal pressure, they leak urine. So that's a, a specific usually for females or with men that have undergone procedures like radical prostatectomy. Nocturia is specific for the nighttime frequency, uh, and that can be caused for various reasons. It may be the overactive bladder, but in some cases, patients mobilize more fluid at night. During the day, they're, they're sort of storing more fluid in their lower extremities and the lower part of their body, and then when they lie down, they put their legs up, that fluid shifts back in, they have to urinate more because of that. Sometimes it has to do with um, the, the have, um, um, sleep apnea, 
and the, they wake up, they figure, well, I'm awake, I might as well go to the bathroom, and that is the underlying cause of their nighttime frequency. Uh, and there could be other reasons as well. So specific to MS, uh, urinary dysfunction, it's because of the, the neurological aspects, obviously, depending on where the lesions are, where the problem is from their MS will determine what kind of urinary problem they may have. So if it involves the, um, uh, the spinal cord, uh, they are more likely to have uh, retention. If it's higher up, if it's the brain stem, they're more likely to have urinary frequency urgency. To make things more complicated, there's other things called dyssynergia. Uh, dyssynergia is where the bladder and the sphincter don't talk to each other. So the bladder, as I mentioned, has two functions. It has to store urine and it has to empty urine. So during the storage phase, the bladder relaxes and the sphincter and the pelvic floor contract to store the urine. During the emptying phase, obviously, the bladder contracts and the pelvic floor and the sphincter have to relax to let the urine out. When the bladder and the sphincter aren't talking to each other, which happens sometimes with MS more than other neurological issues, when they aren't working together, the bladder's trying to contract against a closed outlet. And that causes damage to the bladder and over time, the bladder fails. So that's called detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. Detrusor meaning the bladder. Detrusor hyperactivity impaired contractility is also a, a, a more complex issue where the bladder is overactive. It doesn't want to store urine well, but then when it's time to empty, it doesn't contract well. The bladder muscle is weak. So it doesn't work well at either end of the spectrum. And it doesn't uh, store and it doesn't empty and it makes it a very complicated situation to try to remedy that. So our goals when it comes to voiding dysfunction in MS patients is we first want to preserve the upper tracts, the kidneys. Those patients that go into retention can do damage to their kidneys if the urine backs up. Uh, this used to be much more of a problem many years ago where the most common cause of of, uh, of death in patients with neurogenic bladder was the, the uh, uh, renal uh, failure. Um, but that's no, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not in that era anymore. Uh, adequate emptying of the bladder at low pressure is our, our main goal after that. And then adequate storage, because it's much more important to get the urine out than to, get to uh, have it uh, stay in. And then, of course, urinary incontinence Urinary continence is, is a, a major goal. But we usually go in those orders. Lifestyle changes. Well, we could try fluid management. Uh, trying to restrict fluid before bedtime is often recommended. Caffeine reduction. Caffeine is both a diuretic and a stimulant to the bladder. Bladder irritants, that could be alcohol, uh, acidic foods, spicy foods. Not everybody is sensitive, but in certain patients are, and it stimulates their bladder to want to go. Uh, weight, weight loss is, uh, will affect the bladder, more pressure on the bladder when there's uh, obesity. Bowel management is important because the bladder and the bowel are next door neighbors. One, one is not working well, the other doesn't work well. So when patients are severely constipated, the bladder may not function properly. So uh, they did uh, on this slide put Metamucil on there because the American diet is so low in fiber, but um, uh, Metamucil can cause gas, so I usually recommend Benefiber or Citrusel. It, it causes less flatulence. And then certain medications can interfere with the bladder function. Obviously, diuretics that are used to control blood pressure, but uh, there's also now a lot of um, new medicines for uh, diabetes, uh, Farsiga, Genuvia, and when patients are taking those, they take the sugar out of their blood and they put it in their urine, and having sugar in the urine then becomes my problem because now that's a diuretic, it stimulates the bladder, it causes uh, uh, sometimes urinary infections and so on. But um, uh, they're good med medicines for lowering blood sugar, but they sometimes complicate the bladder function. Non-pharmacological treatment. So we could try pelvic floor exercises. That may not be the best thing for patients with MS, but for patients like um, 
uh, who do have stress incontinence, like women who have had uh, childbirth and sometimes uh, develop stress incontinence with coughing, sneezing, laughing, lifting, straining, bearing down, jumping and running, and any kind of other movement, they can increase the, the resistance to the bladder outlet by building up the muscles. But they are called Kegel exercises. They have to be continued. They're not easy to do. Uh, so um, we find that they aren't all that successful, at least in, in Americans. It works better in Europe. I think they're more prone to do the exercises. Bladder training, trying to increase time between voiding, really doesn't work that well, I'm afraid. Double voiding is for patients that have difficulty emptying their bladder. We ask them to sit down, void, empty their bladder, and if uh, they could stand up and then wait about 30 seconds, relax, take a few breaths, and then sit down again and finish emptying. They can uh, eliminate the post-void residual or decrease the amount of urine that is left behind. Crede is when patients have to create more pressure for a bladder that is not very strong, doesn't have a strong push. So they either lean forward on the toilet or they create a knot with their hands and they push in and push on the bladder with their hands, trying to create more pressure to get the urine out. Time voiding means that the caregiver or uh, the patient uses the clock to realize when they should void, not rely on the bladder to tell them when it's time. They may have decreased sensation of their bladder uh, and you wanna prevent the incontinent episode by uh, preempting it by voiding every three, maybe four hours and uh, preventing an incontinent episode that way. Uh, medications, well, we have medicines that we have been using for many, many years to calm the bladder down. If it's an overactive bladder, the classic medication is oxybutynin. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Uh, there's three generations of bladder medicine. Oxybutynin was the first one. It has side effects. It causes dry mouth, constipation. It may actually have some cognitive effects as well. So that's the first generation. Second generation was tolteridine and trospium, otherwise Sanctura and uh, Detrol. And third generation was Vesicir, Enabilix. Um, and now we have a fourth generation, which are the beta-3 agonists. And these are quite good because they don't have a lot of side effects. That's Gemtessa and Merbitric. And uh, they they work quite well, and I, and I really like prescribing them because I don't have to worry so much about the side effects, dry mouth, constipation, and cognitive effects. Um, in terms of medications to open the bladder outlet, to relax the bladder outlet, uh, the most common medicine prescribed by urologists is Flomax, Tamsulosin. And we use that in men mostly who have enlarged prostates so that they can get the urine out and uh, avoid more effectively. It does work in patients that might have MS who have retention or high residual urine. They're not emptying well. And so we can sometimes use Flomax in these patients. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't any great medication to get the bladder to squeeze better. There's not a lot that we have to get the bladder to push the urine out better. Uh, there are ones called urocholine, bethanicol. They don't get absorbed well. They don't work very well but it's sometimes what we try as a, as a desperation move. So other than the oral medications, if the patient's still having difficulties with retaining urine, being able to hold onto the urine for the urge incontinence and overactive bladder, we sometimes inject Botox into the bladder. We've been doing this for a number of years. It's quite effective, uh, and, uh, uh, but it has to be repeated every six months. The Botox wears off but it's, a, it's an excellent uh, treatment. I use it in a fair number of my MS patients because uh, uh, it, it's very effective and they don't have the side effects of taking oral medication. Sacral nerve stimulation is where we uh, put in a, I, I don't wanna call it a pacemaker for the bladder, but it's, it's a way of stimulating the S3 nerve, the sacral nerves, to, to get the bladder to function more effectively. It's used for overactive bladder. It can also be used for fecal incontinence. Those patients that have uh, inability or, or difficulty retaining their, their feces, this will work very well for them. And finally, in the last uh, resort is for urinary incontinence pads, uh, diapers, 
PureWick, I don't know if you're familiar with, it's a very clever device. It's basically a sponge with a, a vacuum tubing to, uh, attached to it. So when the patient's in bed, uh, they put this uh, mostly for females uh, near the vagina, and it catches the urine. Rather than having to wear a diaper, it sucks it up uh, to the, uh, the container at the bedside. So here's the sacral nerve stimulation that I was mentioning, and um, uh, it gets implanted in the upper buttock, uh, and then there's some wires that go in through the the uh, sacrum. They're just they replace those wires with a needle, and uh, the but the battery itself goes in the uh, upper buttock, and uh, the batteries now last 15 years. And uh, we're not exactly sure how it works, but it seems to work. It doesn't work that great in MS patients because I believe that due to some of the demyelination, uh, the nerves don't conduct the electricity uh, very well, as well. Uh, effects of avoiding dysfunction can significantly impact a patient's quality of life, causing embarrassment, social isolation, and depression. It can lead to urinary tract infection, renal damage, skin breakdown, and other complications. Patients may need to make lifestyle adjustments, such as avoiding fluids, scheduling bathroom breaks, and wearing protective garments. So it's a major part of MS. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, it's a major part of the general population, too. Overactive bladder, again, affects 48 million Americans, and uh, it's, a, it's a common, common problem. Voiding dysfunction is common, affecting the majority of MS patients. The effects of voiding dysfunction can be devastating, and uh, treatment options are available, can improve a patient's quality of life. And we work together with the neurologists, the physiotherapists, and their caregivers to find out what works for that patient individually, because uh, there's no one size fits all. So now we're going to talk about something more fun. Now we, we go. Uh, uh, to something a little more interesting. So we're going to talk about sexual dysfunction, and, and uh, there's a few things that are unique to the MS patient, but uh, pretty much this talk could be given to any, any group. So the frequency of uh, sexual dysfunction in the MS group is between 75 to 84% in men and 45 and 85% in women. All phases of sexuality are affected. There's a significant impact on quality of life. And uh, there does not seem to be a connection between the, uh, the, uh, the, the impact of the sexual dysfunction and the duration of the illness. Now, there's four categories of sexual dysfunction. First is desire, the lack of interest in, in, in uh, having uh, sexual relations. And obviously, this is more common in women than men. Arousal is the, the uh, inability to either uh, lubricate or in the female or have the erection in the male. The orgasm disorder is that you're in the mood and you have the, uh, uh, the ability, but you're not able to reach climax or, or, or satisfactory result. And then there's pain during intercourse. So male sexual dysfunction is defined as the persistent inability to achieve or maintain an erection sufficient for satisfactory sexual intercourse. If there's a lack of desire, there can be a hormonal issue, um, but it isn't always the case, but it's something that needs to be checked. And if there is a lack of testosterone, uh, we can replace the testosterone or we can help the patient produce more of their own testosterone but it's not always the, the panacea. Difficulty achieving erection, one of the things we want to make sure of is there's adequate blood flow. We sometimes use an ultrasound to measure blood flow in and, and out of the penis. Patients that have difficulty maintaining erections, it can be due to venous leak, that there's microscopic valves that are responsible for holding the blood in the penis, that they'll have an erection, adequate blood flow in, but then the blood leaks back out again. Premature ejaculation is a complex issue. We're not exactly sure uh, why that happens to some men, 
Uh, 20% of men will have premature ejaculation in, in a various times in their life and may come and go. We could try behavioral modification. We could try desensitizing condoms. There's sprays and uh, uh, a numbing medications that could be put on the, on the penis. Uh, the SSRIs, the, their antidepressants have a side effect in which they actually um, inhibit uh, a climax. And patients that take it for depression sometimes want to go off the medication because they get frustrated. But in small doses, we use that for premature ejaculation. Cialis can help the patient to have that second erection quickly, so there's a shorter uh, 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 time between erections. Tramadol is a pain medication. For some reason, it seems to also have an effect on, on uh, climax, premature climax. And a penile constriction band is something that can uh, hold the penis up for a half hour by simply acting like a tourniquet at the base of the penis. There's patients that have difficulty reaching climax. That's called anorgasmia. And Peyronie's disease uh, is the curvature of the penis. And we use mostly now the Zyaflex, which is a collagenase enzyme that gets injected into the scar to, uh, to uh, break that up. But um, uh, there's also devices that patients can use like Restorex, which helps straighten the penis and just kind of uh, bend it back into a normal shape. So in terms of causes of erectile dysfunction, there's psychogenic, neurogenic, hormonal, vasculogenic, drug-induced. Some of the antihypertensive medicines can affect erections, uh, and um, um, as well as certain antidepressants. Um, uh, there's medicines that we use for prostate cancer, obviously, that will affect cigarette smoking, alcohol abuse, and uh, other systemic diseases. So when we talk about systemic diseases, uh, multiple sclerosis shows up on that list for the neurologic. There is a specific survey for um, uh, MS patients and sexual health, and I'm going to put up this slide. Uh, wait a second. I'm going to put up this slide here, and if you want to take a, a picture with your phone. Uh, there's a QR uh, symbol there. This is a useful questionnaire to uh, bring with you to your, your doctor's office. And it goes through, it helps us to try to figure out is the problem with the sexual dysfunction related to MS directly or is it related to something else? So it, it is a useful um, uh, thing to, to provide your, your caregiver. So that's, that's this QR code right here if you want to take a picture of that. So with respect to the male, the erectile dysfunction, there is multiple causes, aging, diabetes, uh, other neurological causes, hypertension, cigarette smoking has a major impact because it affects the blood vessels, uh, anxiety, stress, uh, uh, neurological diseases, alcohol, low testosterone levels and medications. And so the first step, of course, is to try to uh, try lifestyle changes. Uh, if it's heart healthy, it's usually penis healthy. And there is algorithms, but the reality is when it comes down to most men who are having erectile dysfunction, they're sort of faced with the same treatments. It almost doesn't matter what their underlying problem is. We're still going to offer them the same treatments. And uh, so that is the medications like Viagra and Cialis and Levitra. Those are called PDE5 inhibitors. The vacuum device, uh, I'll, uh, I'll explain to you in a moment. Uh, in, the intraurethral uh, uh, suppository that goes inside the opening of the penis injections of medication directly into the penis, and then surgery. So the vacuum device is usually the first most um, least invasive step uh, other than the PD-5 inhibitors instead of Viagra and Cialis. This is usually the next step when those medications don't work. And it works on a very simple principle where you have a, oop, you have a vacuum pump 
that uh, usually it's battery operated. The old fashioned ones were, were hand, were manual, but it creates a vacuum inside the cylinder, pulling blood into the penis. And once the penis is erect, you have to place this rubber band, the constriction device that I mentioned earlier, that is on the cylinder. You slide it off the cylinder onto the base of the penis and it holds the penis up for 30 minutes. And then you have to take it off in order to let the blood flow again. And then it can be used again if necessary. The suppositories that are placed inside the opening, it's like a lollipop with a stem. You push that down inside the urethra. You push the little uh, waxy pellet down in there and it's supposed to deliver the medication that way. They're about $60 a pellet. Patients don't really care for it. It's not very popular. There's penile injection therapy, which is uh, does work very well for just about every male. It's got a 95% effective rate. And it sounds awful, but it really is a, a, a tiny needle. It's the same one that diabetics use. It's a small volume of fluid, and it's more psychologically painful than physically painful, but uh, it does work. And uh, it's not a bad option for a lot of patients. We teach patients how to do that every day. And when all else fails, then we go to surgery. And the surgery involves placing these cylinders inside the top half of the penis. Those are the corpora cavernosum. It's above where the urine and the semen flow through, the, the urethra. There's a pump that pl is placed inside the scrotum. So when the patient wants to activate it, they'll pump it up about 15 times. It's a little round uh, ball there, that they, a uh, cylinder there that they'll, they'll pump up. It takes the fluid out of the reservoir, which is placed in the lower part of the abdomen. These are, this is all one piece. There's three, it's called a three-piece penile prosthesis, but it all comes together. And the reservoir is where the fluid is stored. The pump takes the fluid from the reservoir and puts it inside the cylinder. And once the cylinders are, are erect, uh, then it can stay up for as long as the patient wants. And when he wants to bring it down, they will simply press on a button on the bottom of the scrotum here underneath the skin and uh, it will take the fluid out of the cylinders and put it back into the reservoir. This is the penile constriction device. It's basically either a rubber band or something similar that uh, squeezes the base of the penis to hold the blood in. Now, female sexual dysfunction. This is the real mystery. This is the tough one. Um, there's so much that we don't know about the female sexual dysfunction. So uh, I'm going to talk about what we know, and, and, but the truth is it's much more complicated. I used to have a slide that showed the difference between male and female sexual dysfunction. The male was an on-off switch. The, the female was this complicated computer with wires and lights and bells and whistles. So uh, we're, we don't have it fully uh, down. But the bottom line is, uh, women do have uh, issues with uh, this, especially in MS patients, and we try to figure out where that problem is coming from. So the first thing is obviously, you know, talk therapy, uh, practice half healthy lifestyle habits, uh, seek counseling with a sexual health therapist. Uh, there, there are, are a number of them that are around that are very good. Uh, often patients have problems with lubrication, so we do recommend lubrication. And even if necessary, they can try a, a device like a vibrator to help increase the stimulation. Estrogen therapy is a, a very uh, common and safe uh, treatment for a lot of patients, not just for sexual dysfunction, but once a woman goes through menopause, the vaginal tissues are lacking estrogen. They get thin, they get dry, they get irritated. It can even affect their bladder function. Uh, the incontinence and so on can be affected. So I like to use a vaginal estrogen cream for my patients. They use a fingertip method. They don't use the, the, the little plunger that comes with it. Uh, and they use that maybe two or three nights a week. And that maintains good health of the vaginal tissues without absorption into the blood. They're always concerned about the risk for cancer. And the reality is it doesn't really get absorbed into the bloodstream. It's really 
only on the surface. It works like a hand lotion, but it makes those tissues healthier. Uh, there are some other new medications that are out there. I don't have a lot of experience with them, to be honest with you, but there are, there's Osfina, which is a non-hormonal treatment for patients that want to use something to help uh, with uh, vaginal atrophy, atrophic vaginitis, uh, so that they don't have to take a, a vaginal cream or oral estrogen. But uh, I, don't have, I haven't used that very much. They have tried giving females testosterone therapy since that helps men with their libido. They thought it would also help women with theirs. I don't think it works very well, quite frankly. And no woman wants to start growing a mustache either. That doesn't make her very sexy. Um, there's one called Adie, which is supposed to stimulate their, uh, their sexual uh, arousal. Uh, uh, increase their, their libido, but it has side effects. You can't take it with alcohol, which is the biggest problem. Uh, patients have, uh, have had uh, uh, passed out uh, if it's taken anywhere around the time of alcohol. And as far as I know, alcohol has always been involved in every sexual function. Um, Valisi is, uh, uh, has side effects also. This is another one for low sexual desire. The patient gives themselves an injection. It can include nausea, vomiting, flushing, headache, and a skin reaction. So not very sexy. And uh, we've tried Viagra in females, and it really has not worked. It's been a disappointment. So I think I made it under my time allotment. I've got 10 seconds left, and I'm going to leave it open for questions. Thank you very much. So one of the questions that came in online is from a guy. He wants to know if there's any medications available for to increase sensation in his in his little guy. All right. He um, he he has no sensation. All right. And so he wants to know what can be done. He, he can get erect, but he doesn't feel anything. So the lack of feeling is going to be uh, more neurological that probably is it's more systemic. He probably has decreased sensation uh, in other parts of his body as well. And uh, but there's nothing specific urologically that I can suggest for that. Thank you for that. Next one wants to know your thoughts on um, Botox for incontinence. Botox or what? I'm sorry. Incontinence. Incontinence. Yes. Botox is. I use a lot of Botox. Botox is, is a, uh, is is a great alternative, uh, especially for patients that have side effects with the medication or the medications don't work. Um, I use it probably more in my MS patients than in the general population. It lasts six months, and we have to go in with a scope into the bladder. We eject the bladder itself. Uh, not really comfortable, I'm afraid. But I've been doing Botox for a number of years. I was involved in the clinical research to get it FDA approved. So I have a lot of experience with Botox. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, but then the patients sometimes have to learn self-intermittent catheterization. If, they're, uh, if we want to store the urine well, uh, they may not be able to empty well. The Botox doesn't know to turn off when it's time to void. So we sometimes have to modify the dosage to try to find the right dose. But quite often, they end up uh, with catheters. Does does the Botox increase the rate of um, uh, the frequency of uh, UTIs? Uh, no, it doesn't actually. I have patients that have suprapubic tubes, and, and I just realized there's a slide that's missing from my deck. Uh, but anyway, uh, the patients that have suprapubic tubes, uh, she she takes the Botox every six months because it seems to reduce her, her infections and it seems to reduce the crystals that form in her uh, bladder from the suprapubic tube. Uh, and uh, we've been doing that a number of years. But uh, no, it doesn't actually cause uh, infection unless you're retaining urine, unless it's someone who is having high residuals with the Botox and that uh, the urine acts like stagnant pond water and they can get infection that way. And uh, can you combine uh, techniques, for example, use the bladder stimulator plus the Botox? You can. You can use a, a combination of things. We also often have to get creative with MS patients. We have to use 
either the bladder stimulator in medications or Botox with medications. It's, it's just you tailor it to the patient, whatever is necessary. Um, yes, this wasn't my first question, but what is a super pubic tube like? What is that? Ah, okay. I apologize. There's a slide missing. So in terms of managing patients with uh, urinary retention or incontinence, um, as far as devices, they, we have to sometimes use catheters on these patients. An indwelling catheter that goes in the penis or in the uh, urethra for the female, the vagina, is uh, problematic. It, it wears down the, the urethra. They, it, sometimes it splits the penis over time. Uh, in the female, they end up with a wide open urethra that is so large that um, nothing, no catheter can fill the space. So in some cases, what we use for a lot of the neurogenic bladder patients is a super pubic tube. It's basically a Foley catheter that goes in directly through the skin into the bladder. And that tube will drain their bladder. They have to change it once a month. Um, and it, it, uh, it, it works quite well. A lot of my patients with neurogenic bladders uh, use a suprapubic tube. Okay. Um, if you're taking um, meds for incontinence for a while, and after a prolonged time, every time you start taking the, the incontinence meds, you start to urinate more, what does that mean? So the, the question sounds like uh, you've used medications for urinary incontinence, but when you use them, you start to drip more. I'm willing to bet you may have more of a problem with uh, overflow, that you're already retaining too much urine. And what is happening is the medications that are the, the, the anticholinergic medications, the ones that I mentioned that, uh, uh, or, or any of the medicines that calm the bladder down, you're not emptying. The medicines don't know to turn off when it's time for you to go, so you're leaving more urine behind, and you're starting to drip quicker because the bladder's still, you're leaving the bathroom half full or more. Uh, I should mention there's other types of catheters. There's self-intermittent catheterization where the patient will learn how to use the catheter by placing it inside and then throw, uh, taking it out and throwing it away. Um, this is another very common thing that we use in MS patients. Works quite well. Patients learn to do it. It becomes like brushing their teeth. They catheterize themselves about every four hours or so, every uh, uh, somewhere between four to six times a day. And uh, it, it's actually, it's, it's, the catheters are always covered by insurance. It's never a problem. Uh, they've made tiny ones that are lipstick-sized catheters. They, they fold on themselves, and so they can carry it in their purse. Uh, there's, there's all different types of catheters that are available. Different companies make it, and they're very, uh, they're very good. They're hydrophilic, so you don't have to use any jelly. They're, they come in a package with that, are, they're already wet, and they slide in and slide out very easily person is asking, going back to the incontinence, are there any significant changes in incontinence or post, for postmenopausal women with multiple sclerosis? So uh, overactive bladder is a huge problem, mostly in women and mostly in older women. So it seems to affect postmenopausal women more. We don't know exactly what the reason is. Um, we try to use estrogen, as I mentioned, uh, estrogen cream. It seems to help a small percentage of them. But my feeling is I think a lot of it is related to their lower backs, that uh, many patients, especially women as they get older, develop osteoporosis, their lower backs start to give them problems, and they are the nerves that go to the bladder uh, through the spinal cord and the uh, pelvic nerves get affected. But uh, uh, estrogen by itself is not really a, a, a primary treatment for overactive bladder and urge incontinence. If they have some stress incontinence, the estrogen does make the, the tissues around the urethra, the sphincter, thicker and fuller. And it sometimes helps to hold the urine in a little bit better because the tissues are not as thin. Is there anything specific that helps nocturia? So nocturia is a little more complicated than straight overactive bladder. It can be overactive bladder, but some patients uh, 
uh, will, especially as we get older, we tend to uh, have problems with fluid shifts in the lower part of our, our body, that their legs get, the ankles might swell, and sometimes it's not even noticeable. So when those patients lie down, they put their legs up, that fluid shifts back in. In other cases, it can be due to uh, a lack of hormone, DDAVP or vasopressin. And uh, that is the medi that's a hormone that slows up the, it's an antidiuretic hormone. It, it slows up the production of urine. So in rare cases, we will give these patients uh, the DDAVP. It's the same thing we use in children that wet their beds, and it slows up the actual production of urine at night. But then they have to catch up during the day. Does prostate stimulation aid sensation? Maybe. Okay. Guess it depends on the person, right? I, 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 I'm not going to touch that one, yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I think you already did, doctor. I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, next. Is a vaginal cream over the counter? No. No, it's a, it's a, a prescription, uh, but there is generic. Uh, uh, typical ones are estrace and premarin. Yes, I wanted to ask if you know, if you've heard down the line, if there's any attempt to make any type of overactive bladder medication available that doesn't have the anticholinergic side effects. So the question is, are there medications that don't have the anticholinergic side effects for overactive bladder? Yes, the beta-3 agonists, uh, Gemtessa and Merbitric, do not have the side effects that oxybutynin and its other, one, other ones have. And that's why I like those. They're really very good. They're once a day, and they don't have side effects. Okay, thank you. Next, back to erectile dysfunction. Person is asking is if this is physical or emotional. <laughs> Again, it depends. You know, it's it up to the individual. Sexual function is the most complicated thing we do as human beings. So there's the psychological, there's the emotional, there's the the neurological, there's the vascular, there's a hormonal aspect to it. And it, it gets all mixed in, it's all complicated, and uh, uh, there's no straight answer. We're, 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 we don't have any, that's why we have basically the same six treatments for male uh, erectile dysfunction is because it almost doesn't matter what the problem is, we, but that's all we're, we're, we have. Good. If a patient has a neurogenic bladder, which are the good candidates and the bad candidates for the sacral nerve stimulator? So the patient has a neurogenic bladder, who's a candidate for sacral nerve stimulation? Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's really no medication that helps the bladder to, to push better, squeeze better. The only thing that might help some patients is sacral nerve stimulation. Um, it's the only thing, it helps at both ends of the spectrum. It helps the patient with a severely recalcitrant overactive bladder that they are urinating too frequently. And it also works on some patients that have urinary retention. And it might work in those patients that have dyssynergia. Those patients that their, their sphincter and their bladder aren't talking to each other, it might help that, uh, it might help in those cases. But uh, my experience with the sacral nerve stimulation in, in uh, MS patients is not as good as the, the other patients. And I have a feeling it has to do with their, their uh, lack of uh, uh, the demyelination of the nerves, the actual demyelination. I don't think they conduct electricity as well as other patients. So I've been a little disappointed. This is by a nurse. MS patients may have constipation. Uh, does a full colon affect the ability to urinate as well. The bowel and the bladder are neighbors, and when one isn't working right, the other doesn't work right. So we do recommend a bowel regimen uh, for patients uh, uh, who have neurogenic bladder or, or, or and, because when the bowel is working better, the bladder seems to work better too. Thank you, doctor. Um, if a patient has a neurogenic bladder and also has the sacral nerve stimulator, and, but it doesn't really work. Like you said, it may, may or may not work. Can it be removed? Of course, yes. I mean, anything we put in can pretty much be removed. Um, 
But some cases, I, I try to avoid removing it uh, uh, until I'm absolutely sure that it's not going to work because we've gone to so much trouble to put it in. The sacral nerve stimulator uh, has to be, can be reprogrammed. And there's so many, there's almost an infinite, infinite number of programs that can be done with it. So we spend a lot of effort and time putting it in. We're going to make sure that it's not working by reprogramming it, testing it out, reprogramming, testing it out. But in some cases, it just doesn't seem to do anything. It doesn't do any harm in there. It just sets off the alarm when you go through the airport. But otherwise, it doesn't do any harm while it's there. Um, with um, a nerve stimulator and, um, and uh, MRIs, for example, has been a challenge, like uh, doing MRI sometimes, like to come back to the urologist and everything. Uh, first question, do you uh, experience that? And uh, when do you get into the point that you say it's not working? Because you can change the programs and then go back to previous programs as well and, and make sure that it's not like it's not uh, working for that particular program, then works a little bit in the other one. So the expectations is not is not going to work 100%, but maybe partially uh, work. So I think that it's uh, important also to set the right expectations for for uh, MS patients. And the other one, I'm, I believe that it's a question that a lot of women want to ask, but it's a little bit... Uh, um, there are any reports that uh, one vibrator works better than the other? Like uh, uh, any of your patients has said, oh, that one works marvel marvelously, <laughs> for example. All right. Um, well, let me address the first question uh, about the sacral nerve stimulator. So you have to understand the sacral nerve stimulation is not indicated for MS patients, okay? We do it out of desperation, but it's not indicated for MS patients. So I've, when it first came out, I've been doing the sacral nerve stimulation for over 20 years, probably 25 years. It came out in the early 2000s. So um, sacral nerve stimulation is, it relies on the nerves to be functioning. And unfortunately, the MS patients, the nerves don't work well. So it's really not indicated for them. But out of desperation, I've tried it. I've been a bit disappointed, but it's not meant to be for MS patients. So we still want to try to utilize it as much as possible. So we try reprogramming it, which so on. As far as the MRIs go, the newer ones are MRI compatible. The old fashioned ones that I used to do with Interstim, Medtronic, uh, were less MRI compatible. Medtronic owned this space for many years, for about 20 years, and nobody had, there was no competition. They didn't upgrade their technology. They just, they, they had a monopoly. Another company came along, Axonix. They came into the space about six years ago and they developed a, they built a better mousetrap. And that meant that they, the, the one, the, their ones are MRI compatible. They were easy to place. It was the same technology, but they improved on the technology. They made it more, more modern. And, uh, but it's still the same thing. And, but they are MRI compatible now, most of them. As far as the vibrator, um, you know, I, I haven't asked, I haven't gotten any feedback. Um, I, and, uh, I, I, I encourage you to just explore. <laughs> there you go. Good answer. All right. Next question online person wants to know if pelvic exercises can be recommended for men and if so which ones would you recommend well that's a good question actually so the pelvic floor exercises really were developed for females mostly postpartum after delivering women had problems with incontinence and they have to build up those muscles that baby's head stretched out uh and uh they work, you know, well enough in women. In men, you know, it's a different story. Now, if they had a radical prostatectomy, if they had surgery, then those we encourage those patients to do the Kegel exercises and so on. Uh, I do have a colleague in, uh, in New Jersey who uh, has a program for basically men to do pelvic floor exercises to help with their erections and so on, too. 
Uh, and uh, so, but I'm not sure how effective it really is. Uh, but uh, for incontinence patients, it, it, you can build up the muscles. You can also build up the resistance to the bladder. When you do a Kegel exercise, you're tightening your pelvic floor. There's a reflex that tells the bladder to shut up. There's a reflex that tells the bladder quiet, quiet down. So you can do those exercises to try to retrain the bladder to some degree. When you are careful with your diet and exercise, including eight glasses of water a day, but continue to experience discomfort as food digests, is there any way to avoid this pain and discomfort? Uh, I don't know. I, okay. I, I can't answer that. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Next, what are the advances in suprapubic surgery, and what do you recommend for someone who self-caths 24-7 in bed? What advances in suprapubic catheters? Is that uh, what they're referring to, the suprapubic surgery, if it's the catheters? I, I would imagine. I would imagine. Uh, it really hasn't changed very much. The suprapubic catheter is pretty easy to place. Uh, it does require anesthesia, but it takes about 15 minutes. And once you have that catheter in the suprapubic area, uh, it, it'll, uh, it just has to be changed once a month. But if you were to take it out and not replace a catheter right away, that hole will close up. That tract will close very quickly in a matter of hours sometimes. So if a catheter falls out, the patient has to get a new one in immediately. Uh, as far as self intermittent catheterization, there's really good catheters out there now. There's ones that have, for the male, they have a slight curvature that, that is called a coude catheter or teeman tip because the male urethra is an S-curve. It's not straight. So they have ones that have a curve that follow the, the male urethra uh, more, in its na natural ana anatomy, and it's easier for the males to use. Um, patients that do self intermittent catheterization that get good at it, it's no problem. They say it's it um, uh, it's like brushing their teeth. It, they it's not a big deal. And again, they've developed the catheters that they're they're self-contained. They have ones that even have a bag attached to it, so you don't even have to even use a bathroom. You don't have to be over the toilet. You can catheterize yourself. It goes into the bag. You just toss the bag in the garbage. And there's many, many, many companies out there. Many variations of catheters. Uh, what what is the name of the device you said for women while sleeping um, for urination? So yeah, the device for women that uh, to catch their urine so they don't have to wear a diaper so much is called Purewick, P U R E W I C K. Uh, for the males, it's mostly condom catheters. Uh, they wear a condom that has a, a a bag connected to it over the side of the bed. And it just catches the urine uh, while they're while they might be sleeping, uh, but condom catheters can have problems. The patients can get urinary infections and so on from them. But the Purewick is a really simple, clever device that's basically just a a banana shaped sponge that goes uh, between their legs. And if they happen to leak urine, it just sucks it up right away before it uh, they get before they get wet. Thank you. Next one, the person's also asking, what, did, what do you recommend for someone who self-caths 24-7 in bed? Uh, so someone that has to do, bless you, so someone that has to do self-intermittent catheterization while in bed. Right. Uh, it's tough. Uh, it, when we have to catheterize patients in the hospital and they're in bed, we sometimes have to put something underneath them to lift them out of the bed because the bed, their bottom sinks down into the bed. So we'll take a bedpan traditionally and turn it upside down. And that way it, it supports their bottom so that we can get the catheter in. Uh, I imagine that's a similar problem with anybody at home with, uh, that's in bed doing self intermittent cath. It's just, uh, they sink into the bed. So you have to put something underneath them to raise them up. Okay, thank you. The person is asking what they could do for urinary leakage and should they possibly be using a vibrator to help tighten the muscles? Uh, the vibrator is not going to tighten the muscles for leakage. Uh, so 
Uh, but in terms of urinary leak, it depends on the reason. If it's due to overactive bladder and urge incontinence, then we use those methods that I was saying, which is basically medication, Botox, sacral nerve stimulation, uh, or uh, time avoiding, or whatever else we do for the urge incontinence. If it's stress incontinence, that they're leaking because of a weak valve, uh, we could either do a sling, uh, which is a, a little hammock that gets placed underneath the urethra. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes, the outpatient procedure. In some cases, we use a bulking agent. We inject something that's the same stuff that people inject in their lips and in their face to, to bulk up the tissues, give them the big, the big lips. But we inject it around the urethra, and it acts like a washer for a, a leaky faucet. It holds the urine in better. And that's for stress and cons. That's where the valve is not working properly. Great. Thank you. Next, if a person has urinary leakage, would you recommend... Uh, the period panties to use overnight. I guess period pamp pampies. Pamp so, oh, okay, just a pa pa pads, uh, menstrual pads. Um, the problem with using pads or diapers is that the moisture is held close to the, the uh, perineum, to the bladder, and there's a potential for skin breakdown or recurrent infection. The moisture allows the bacteria to grow. It creates a warm, dark, moist environment so that they have greater uh, ability to grow and they can get urinary tract infection. So um, we're not, we try very hard. That's the last resort. That's, that's the last thing we can, we can do is, is diaper or panties or uh, uh, the pad. So the last question I have for you before I have to run up there is, do you know if ongoing kidney stones somehow affect bladder symptoms in MS? Uh, probably not. Now, there's some people that make bladder stones, and that's usually because they're not emptying the bladder well, and the urine uh, crystallizes, they form a stone in the bladder, and they can't empty out completely. The stone grows in the bladder. But kidney stones by themselves shouldn't affect the bladder. Uh, they're pretty far away, actually. Great. Thank you. Everybody thank Dr. Samowitz. But don't run away, right? <laughs> All right. And here's the plaque for Dr. Samowitz. Any photographers out there? There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Let me give you this class. Everybody, thank you very much for coming, and thank you all for being online. Bye-bye.